So morning, everybody, and welcome to this last lecture on of the semester on in intro to deep learning. This for this lecture, it's my pleasure and honor to introduce my good friend Cheryl Friedland, who will be doing a a guest lecture on experimental design for machine learning. Now, Gerald's uh, a, a professor over in UC Berkeley. He's got a lot of first his record. He's, he's pretty, uh, uh, he's got a very impressive record, but the specific work that he'll be talking about today is on how to determine the capacity of networks and how do you design the most compact networks for a task. This is, this is one of the uh, uh, more exciting topics that I've seen people work on lately and he's got some of the more exciting results. So, and also he's got a really nice toolkit online that you can get to uh, experiment with once you understand what he's doing. Gerald, the floor's yours. Okay, well, thank you very much. Um, and I'm, I'm, thanks for inviting me and I'm so happy to talk um, about this. And it's, it's, been, it's been a right. Um, so I will, I will talk about this a little bit. Before I go there is um, the goal of well, this talk is just a, a summary. Um, there is actually a whole UC Berkeley class now on experimental design for machine learning. Um, so I'm, I'm also inviting you, if you want more details, to look at this class. Um, but the interesting part here is there's two tools. One is uh, called tfmeter.icsi.berkeley.edu, which actually allows you to design networks, and it will show you all the measurements um, that you'll see um, um, uh, that I'll talk about sort of online and, and, and try it out online. And the other one is a commercial tool now. Um, so I have a startup where we basically make this commercial. So where basically you can put in data and it'll automatically measure out how learnable is the data and also design uh, automatically uh, network and other machine learners uh, for that. And it's called brainome.ai. And you can totally try this out for free. There's a demo button and you just go ahead and try it for free. You can sign up for free. And if you have a project uh, for obviously for universities, uh, let me know and we just we just bump up your account and you can you can totally use it. Um, so that's basically the, um, uh, the, the, two, two, the two tools that come out of this, um, um, uh, you know, sort of th framework of thinking, I have to say, basically. Okay, um, with, with, without that, so it's me, I'm, I'm basically adjunct uh, faculty. I uh, used to be a data scientist at the, at the Lawrence Livermore National Lab too, but I quit that job so I could do my startup. Um, and I started working on machine learning very early, um, just, you know, Big is probably earlier than me, but um, for me it was interesting because uh, machine learning wasn't a big thing back then and, and sort of it was very esoteric and seeing this going into mainstream was interesting. Um, but seeing it going into the mainstream, I also found out that there's a bunch of things missing in machine learning that we don't really have an answer for and we should have an answer for if we actually use it in a real way and here's a very simple question that you normally have to answer if if you're working in in machine learning in industry or in actually in any capacity that is serious right and that is very simple how much money do i actually need to budget for my deep learning experiment and it's interesting that go ahead and go around and ask people for that. And the point is, well, a lot is the answer or yeah, we, we spent a lot of money on, on a lot of compute, but there's not a real answer. And now you go into, into ImageNet and ask yourself, okay, the best models, what do they do? And you see, for example, that AlexNet is, is huge, right? 238 megabytes, 2.27 2, 2 billion op, 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 uh, ops to train it. Then you have this next model. It's just a couple percent worse but it's an order of magnitude smaller, right? And an order of magnitude less to train. And then there's another model with GG16, which again is also in the ballpark of accuracy, but it's yet twice the size of the orbit of AlexNet and 10 times the amount of time to train. And, and so, so when you have something like this, where you have orders of magnitude off okay then you have a problem okay so you, you can be orders of magnitude off you should at least have an order of magnitude of knowing you know is it a million dollars or is it 10 million dollars or is it a hundred thousand dollars i mean that's what an order of magnitude is right and for megabytes it may not matter but for dollars it totally does and so the question here is is there a way to do this more systematically and that's basically what this lecture is about 
So let's start with the game. If I gave you a sequence, two, four, six, eight, okay? Immediately you would say, well, probably 10, 12, 14, 16, eight, and so on. And there's something happening in our brain that's, that we just have to pay attention to for, for a couple of seconds. So two, four, six, eight, um, it's, immediate, it's, it's, it's this immediate like, oh yeah, 10, 12, and so on. If I give you six, five, one, four, you're gonna be like, um, I don't know, six, five, one, four. Hmm. The reason is because six, five, one, four is actually a random number, okay? It's the last four digits of my phone number. And the interesting part though is not only that, when you do two, four, six, eight, ten, 10, and so on, what happens is that your brain infers a rule. The rule is plus two or all even numbers, right? When you can't infer a rule, the only thing you can do is you can memorize those numbers like 6514. You don't have a rule yet, but you can at least memorize the phone number, right? And when you memorize, you still have the data, but when you, when you get the rule, you can do other stuff. For example, if I ask you what's the next number, right? For, for the first sequence of 100,000, you'd say, well, 100,002 immediately because you have this rule. And what did you just do? Well, what you just did is I gave you <laughs> unknown an unknown sample, right? And I asked you, okay, apply this rule. What's, what's next? And you can because you have the rule. So now you can actually generalize your rule. Your rule generalizes the rule that you extracted from 246810 you extract it, generalizes to unseen data. And that's of course the goal, this stuff that we want to do. But for the second sequence, 6514, you don't know. You'd say, I don't know, I could be anything. Does it even, is it even part of it? I don't know. So the answer is, the, the interesting part here is when you have a rule, you can generalize. When you don't have a rule, you can't generalize, you can only memorize, but you can always memorize, okay? And there's one more thing. If I give you two, four, six, eight, ten, 10, um, and I give you two, four, six, eight, ten, twelve, fourteen, sixteen, eighteen, twenty, twenty-two, twenty-four, 14, 16, 18, 20, 22, 24, and so on, you probably say, hey, you need to stop because I already know the rule plus two, why are you giving me more data? And the interesting part here is that this obviously contradicts the typical mantra of there's no data like more data because really there's not more data like more data, there's a waste of time. There's no data like enough data to extract a rule. And once you have that rule, you're fine because you can forget the data that you learned the rule with. If you think about things in your life that you learned, do you remember how you learned them? Usually you don't. You usually just remember what came out of it, which is great because you don't wanna remember all the details of how you learn things. You want to just remember the consequence, in this case, the rule. And I have a question in the chat. Uh, where can we find today's slides? That's a good question. I can ask picture, but I will I will definitely give them to you so you guys can uh, can take a look at them afterwards. So let's let's get more specific. Um, let's get more more uh, general. Um, so we played this game, and we will come back to this. But for now, let's ask ourselves what machine learning actually is. Okay, if we want to understand this, and we want to we want to formalize and 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 basically get to a mathematical uh, fundament of like formalizing this idea of this two, four, six, eight idea. Um, how would we go about this? So here's the interesting part. If you think about what we're doing, where does machine learning actually fit? Then we can actually go back to something really, really old. This is the scientific method itself. The scientific method is you have a question and in order to answer the questions, you do observations, right? So an apple falls on your head and Newton asks, okay, ouch, um, why does it fall on my head? And also what happens if I vary the height of the apple falling? And also what happens if I vary the size, the mass of the apple? Is, is it more ouch, is it less ouch? How does it behave, right? So what you do is you conduct experiments. These experiments give you observations. And the interesting part is that if you just collect observations, that's fine by itself. But the interesting part is at some point you want to come up with a formula like E equals MGH, like Newton's you know, um, uh, conclusion of, okay, actually the, the, the mass and the height uh, you know, makes the, the apple fall uh, with more energy and, and it cause more ouch on my head. And then there's a constant called gravity, but that's a different, different story. The major point is 
if we can have enough observations and then create a theory, then we don't have to do experiments anymore. So basically the idea is you create, you have observations that create a theory and the theory creates predictions so you don't have to do the experiments anymore. And once you have the theory, we call it, we understood it. So we don't have to do the work anymore. We can predict what would happen if you did the work. And now that's a very old process, um, really literally hundreds, if not thousands of years old. And in fact, intuitively done in the stone age and also sometimes by animals, okay? But the formalization is more interesting. So, and why are we talking about this? Well, first of all, in the fifties, we did something, we started something where it's like, okay, we have a theory, but um, we can't do experiments because let's say we do atomic nuclear, some nuclear stuff these experiments are costly, so maybe we can do simulation. And so computers came into the play for the first time in the scientific method. And there was basically prediction um, based on theory that people came up with. And then they simulated and see, does this look like a typical explosion or does this look like, so this was hand baby because obviously of the observation actually is uh, congruent with reality is not even, it was a human judgment call and it's not even clear, right? But the point is we use simulation in computers. And what's really, really new and that's basically, you know, machine learning is that we don't take the theory and what observations are that we judge. No, we just take the observations and then get predictions out. So what happens here is machine learning, all we give the computer is observations, right? We, 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 we could give the computer like all, all, the, all the parameters of when the apple fall, all the measurements of falling apples, and then a regression would find out hopefully that it's proportional to the mass and the, uh, and the height of the apple falling. And obviously if you do cat dog, it's also the same. You give it, you have cat pictures and say that's a cat and dog pictures and say that's a dog. And then obviously you want the computer to find out what the distinction is and prediction. What, what makes the theory that make, when is a dog a dog and when is a cat a cat is a theory, right? So it's actually interesting because we didn't answer those as humans so well. It's all intuitive. But the point is you could have a theory if you had a perfect theory of what makes a cat a cat and what makes a dog a dog, you wouldn't need machine learning for it. You would just program it in. And so the trick is here that, that what's new is we actually want to leave the thinking, the theory part to the computer, okay? And now you can think about the dangers of this. And there's of course a lot of, uh, there's of course a lot of discussion about this. But what's interesting here is we have a lot of thinking about how we build theory. That's really philosophical and, and old and mathematical. We know stuff like Occam's razor, for example, how we build theory. We, so we should be able to apply this theory to machine learning as well. And in general, by the way, I, I, this graph, I call data science because for me, data science, by the way, is the science of, automa of automating the scientific method, right? So we have data and we want to get the theory with the help of a computer. That for me is the science of automating the scientific method. Just, um, I know there's a bunch of definitions out there. Um, for me, that's, that's the most crisp, but that's again, my personal opinion. But the major trick is now that we have this graph and we have, we know that we basically predict, we try to predict observations. Um, we can actually go ahead and, and think about how to formalize it. Um, and so here's the first, first thing that we have to observe. So if we do the scientific method practically, what we see is that we have some person that will do some measurements and that will always be the same. We will always collect observations, okay? That's, that's a fundamental part. And these observations we will record. And the way we record them is, and I'm thinking engineering here, is into a table, okay? Every, that's why Excel is so popular. Excel has 1.3 billion users, okay? I mean, basically, if you, if you, if you think about a table or databases are all mostly table-based, the point is data goes into a table. And if we do so, then we'll basically have a table that where all the columns represent factors of the experiment. It could be the height and the mass of the apple. So that would be a height column and a mass column. And so we have all these factors of the experiment going into the columns of the table. And then you have a final row and we call this the target column. And then in target column, you'll have the outcome of the experiments. Um, so for the apple, it would be maybe, you know, the, the ouch that you measured or the energy obviously the, uh, that the, the apple has, or it could be measured as speed or whatever it is. So basically you have the experimental factors and then you have the outcome and we record this in a table. And in the traditional way of thinking, including, including today, if you have enough data and you're a really smart person, 
you would think about this and your brain would come up with a formula, right? And you know, maybe the formula is E equals MC squared and, and you become really famous and, and, uh, and, and uh, uh, you know, revered for it. But the interesting part is we need to ask ourselves, what is this brain actually doing when, when it does that? And the next question is, as I said, in machine learning now, we replace that brain with something very simple. We replace that brain with a computer. Okay, so we want the computer to actually come up with this theory that describes this table so that we can do predictions, even on experiments we haven't conducted yet. Um, and our computer, by the way, is a finite state machine. Um, and that's important for us because now we can start to argue about states and we can argue about state transitions in the finite state machine. And that's exactly how I'm going about that. So. Um, I will give you a little, a couple more thoughts. And I actually also want to, oh, I forgot to send that to Big Shai. With the slides, I'm gonna send you what I call the machine learning cheat sheet. Because we, I also want to derive sort of, sort of machine learning, not just from, from intuition, but from, from actual you know, research on intelligence. And the first thing is that intelligence was defined by Binet and Simon, the current, um, the, the current, uh, Basically, IQ test is the Stanford BNA test. Okay, this is still there. If you want to join Mensa, you got to do the Stanford BNA test, right? So it's an IQ test. And they define intelligence in 1904 as the ability to adapt. I would actually extend that definition a little bit um, as the ability to adapt to changing goals. Um, and the ability to adapt to changing goals actually is the same as resilience. And if you, if you think about it biologically, then it makes a lot of sense. But you can go with the original definition or you can go with my definition. Um, the ability to adapt to changing goals is actually also a little closer to what we do in machine learning. Because the interesting thing is here, what we do in machine learning is that we adapt a finite state machine, right? It could be a neural network, or it could be a, a decision tree, it could be a Gaussian mixture model. Ultimately, they are, these are all mathematical models that are implemented in the finite state machine to an unknown function, okay? We don't know the function, but we know the observations, right? And the idea is that we actually learn a function that we don't know. And so as we do this, um, we have an input, which is n rows of observations. And that's just the same thing that I just said. We have all these columns and we call these columns x1 to xm. And so we have n rows of observ observations, we call instances in machine learning in a table. Um, and in that table, we have, as I said, x1 to xm and then f of x uh, as, the, um, as the output with sort of the, the observation that we would make if x1 to xm was our experimental input. And so what we want now is we want a state machine that maps all these points x1 to xm to, to sort of the output function. And so ultimately what we'll do is we'll take the table and convert it into a finite state machine, okay? And now before we do anything complicated, before we do think, think, think too complicated, the first way, the trivial, non-thinking about it way of converting this table on the left, which is nothing else but a lookup table, right? On the right to a finite state machine is to just draw an error um, between each of you know, the inputs and the outputs, right? So you could say, if it's exactly this input arrow, it's exactly this output. If it's exactly this input arrow, exactly this output. And what do we have there? A dictionary. Right, so you can always create a dictionary or a lookup table. Well, the table itself, the training data is already sort of uh, a lookup table, but you can always create a dictionary, okay? And guess what? A dictionary is 100% accurate, okay? It's not 100% accurate on validation data or on held out test data, obviously. That's the point. The point is that when you create a lookup table or a dictionary, you can exactly memorize the training data, but you cannot generalize. And so now that should ring a bell again, because remember memorization versus finding a rule. And when we did the little game, that's the trick. So the trick here is you have training data and you could totally memorize it in N state transitions. So N would be the number of instances, right? So you could totally get input, arrow, output, input, arrow, output, and would give you uh, the number of rows in state transitions. So how many state transitions does our finite state machine need to model the training data? Well maximally, and that's the interesting part, is very defined, maximally the same as the number of rows in your table, okay? 
Now, um, the, the, the trick here is that I go a little further. I ask myself, well, what is minimally, right? So not just maximally, but minimally. So minimally is very hard to answer, but there's something you have from information. So if you flip a coin, right? If you flip a coin, then the output is 50-50, right? And so that means, and this is how information works, we have two states. And if you do, uh, we have an uncertainty of, of you know, uh, the probability of head and tail is one half. So that means we have two states that it could be in. One state is head, one state is tail. And then Shannon tells us that we do minus log two of that and it gives us one bit, okay? So basically you have one bit of uncertainty before you flip the coin. And I usually give it minus one bit. This is the information I don't have. It's like money I don't have in a bank account, okay? I have minus one bit of uncertainty when I flip the, before I flip the coin. At the moment I flip the coin, I get one bit of information that is the outcome heads or tails. And now the interesting part here is that is an experiment. I did an experiment. I wanted to know when I flipped the coin, what is the observation? And so knowing that you can ask yourself, okay, if I have a table with, with outcomes and, and uh, sort of there's inputs and outcomes, right? Then obviously each outcome represents a certain amount of information that I get from that, from knowing the outcome of the experiment. And now we have an interesting way of thinking about this, which is, okay, so if I have balanced classes, right? So let's say it's balanced binary classes, then each row of the table will give me one bit of information because each row of the table is equivalent to a coin flip. If I don't have balanced binary, it's not balanced, then it's less than one bit of information. And if it's like multi-class, it could be more, but it gets just more complicated, okay? But the interesting part here is now with information, obviously there is a mathematical framework I can use and that actually is what we are going to, going to do. So we cannot unfortunately so easily go to find out what the absolute minimum is of state transitions. And so we'll have to do that empirically. But we do know that if we have the same number of, 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 of bits, sort of the same, and we will give an, I will give you a notion of how to measure that. If we had the same number of bits, uh, uh, sort of memorized in our machine learner, then we have memorized in our table, then we're overfitting, then basically we're just memorizing. And the easiest way to think about it is it's the number of rows because you create a lookup table, but it could even be less than the number of rows because maybe there's not that much information in the table. To get to minimally um, is, is, is what we do empirically, but the trick is that this is actually what we're gonna do. So what we're gonna do is we, we define an upper limit for memorization which is basically uh, memorizing our data, which is overfitting our data. And we say, well, this would be overfitting. This would be just remembering two, four, six, eight without extracting a rule or six, five, one, four. But if you get to the point where we can represent our table with a lot less parameters, with a lot less memory in the end than our table, then there must be some generalization going on. What is the generalization? Well, it means that one parameter or one, one sort of memory bit of the, of the finite state machine, one state transition of the finite state machine can now represent more than one state transition in the table. That means that each state transition can handle more than one input. And if each state transition can handle more than one input, then you get to the point where you could say, wow, maybe it even can handle inputs that we haven't given it, right? That's the only way you can go there. Of course, at this point, people go and say, yeah, but there's all these papers that say, if you, if you take way more parameters than you need, you can generalize and so on. The answer is, yeah, you could. You can build a car with 25 wheels and it might work, okay? But really as engineers, we want to build a car with the exact number of wheels that we can predict that it will work, okay? We want to have a lot more certainty. And the certainty we get from finding out what is the upper limit because we don't want to memorize and we then we push it down as much as we can to say, ha, huh, this generalizes at 10,000 to one. And I'll give you the generalization measure in this lecture later. So in order to get there, we need one more set of definitions. Um, first of all, I will call the intellectual capacity, the number of unique target functions that a machine learner is able to represent, okay? And that's usually a function of the number of the model of parameters. And now we can define something which is very important 
for this state transition notion, which is the, the memory equivalent capacity. A machine learner's intellectual capacity is memory equivalent to n bits, and the machine learner is able to represent all two to the power of n binary labeling functions of n uniformly random inputs, okay? So what this does is, if I give you a table that is completely uniformly random inputs, and there's uh, the output, uh, the outcome of the, re of the experiment is zero, one, and the zero ones are 50% chance each. So it's just like coin toss. So it's a balanced binary problem. And my machine learner, and these are n rows, and my machine learner is able to represent all these n rows, memorize all these n rows, n rows, then my memory equivalent capacity is n, okay? Because obviously the outcome of these n experiments in my table is n bits because I cannot predict really what's going on. These are random values and it's, it's zero or one randomly. So basically each time you did an experiment, it's just like a coin flip, you get one bit of information. So each row of the table represents one bit of information. And as each row of the table represents one bit of information, I know that n rows represent n bits of information. And if, if my machine learner is able to memorize those, then we say the memory equivalent capacity is n bits. Okay. It looks a lot like entropy. It, yes, but it's a little different, unfortunately. <laughs> I wish it was just be entropy. So the main trick that we, we, will, we, will, we will use here is exactly the trick that we came up in the game, that memorization is worst case generalization. We will talk a lot for the rest of the lecture, basically about memorization and finding out how much my, my uh, what's the capacity, what's the memorization capacity of a neural network. And the trick here is that memorization is understood, just like Bixia just said, it looks a lot like entropy. The point is the math for memorization is super well understood, okay? So now we can actually go and definitely find the upper limit so we can upper bound the, our network size, right? But the interesting part is we already know from the game we played with two, four, six, eight, ten, that we want to be below that. We just we, two, four, six, eight is not interesting. We want plus two, and we will now put an assumption in that we say we want the rule. We want the this sort of thing that the that the machine learner actually deduces be smaller than the memorization capacity. And the smaller the smaller you can get, the more you have guarantee that it'll generalize. And in fact, that is not an assumption. We showed that, and there will be another talk, that you can actually predict your validation accuracy um, based on the generalization ratio that I will show you. And that's, it's a fact. It's, it's, it's also, there's a mathematical proof behind it. Um, we, we're working on publishing it. So basically, if you deduce nothing from the data, the only thing we can do is memorize the observations verb attempt. If your model overfits, it's not, it's not worth more than your lookup table that you use to train it, okay? But using as many parameters of memorization is therefore an indicator that the machine learner did not deduce anything. This is my old slide. The real, this slide will be updated and we will show that this is not just an indicator, we can prove that if you have less parameters than for memorization, you can predict generalization accuracy under the assumption of an IID distribution, obviously for the validation and test set. And reducing, and that's exactly the point, reducing parameters below the memorization will lead to generalization. And so now let's go to the point where we actually go and say, okay, fine, we have this framework, but let's make it useful for us, okay? Let's actually use it. And so first of all, here's a measure for generalization. So for balanced binary classifier, so balanced binary classifier, he is instead of measuring accuracy, accuracy is the number of correctly classified instances divided by the total number of instances you want to classify. And then you can go times a hundred to get percent. We do this generalization is actually very clearly uh, similar. It's just the number of correctly classified instances divided by the memory equivalent capacity. And so what does this do? Well, let's say you have a table with a hundred you know, uh, zero and one outcomes. Um, and that's a 50% chance. So that means there's a hundred bit of memory equivalent capacity um, that you would need in your machine learner to represent this table as a lookup table. Now, the interesting part here is though, if I do, if I do is, you know, either on training or validation set, I measure this and I figure out, huh, the number of correctly classified instances, however, is 10,000. Um, while my memory equivalent capacity of my, of my machine learner is only 100, well, then you have 10,000 divided by 100 uh, would be another 100 bits per bit generalization, right? So basically, you can, correct, you can predict 100 bits uh, of your table 
with one bit of memory equivalence in your model. And that's a huge generalization. And by the way, typically that's generalization when you have that, then you have a very good model. Um, and we, for some of the physics models we were automatically building a generalization is like 20,000 to one. But we have to be careful about two things. One thing is obviously if your generalization goes below one, that means you can correct less instances than you have memory capacity. Um, then you use more parameters in your machine learner than you would need to, to just do a finite state transition dictionary then something is wrong, right? Um, so that's, first of all, G needs to be one or higher. But there's another limit, when that's the information limit. The problem is you could be losslessly compressing and still overfitting, and they call this GMEM. And GMEM for balanced binary is derived in a book uh, by David McKay as two, okay? So for balanced binary, a neural network um, has has still a generalization ratio of two. And if you're not above two, you're still overfitting. Um, but the interesting part is, and, and we'll, we'll talk about this in a, is that GMM will vary greatly once you go to multi-class and also to imbalanced cases. GMM could be 54. So for a 10 class problem with imbalanced classes. So you have to be careful there. Um, and I cannot derive in this lecture GMM for various reasons, but the point is, go for generalization ratios that are as high as possible and you'll be fine. And of course you can still use that to, to test on a validation set. It just gives you a better, it gives you a better handle in the comparison. Um, if you don't have balanced classes, by the way, all you have to do in the mixed total sense is to multiply G by uh, the entropy of the class balance, right? So by, just by the Shannon entropy of the class balance. Um, now, um, the interesting part here is that this measure also is completely independent of, oh, is this IID or not? All we want is that the correctly classified instances are unique, right? Don't put two of the same instances and in, it doesn't help you. But if they are unique, then it's just a measure of generalization. And why? Well, because it's basically a compression ratio, okay? We ask ourselves, how much did the, the, um, the, the machine learner compress the original table, okay? And we have to be careful. It's not actually a compression. And this is where it's different from Shannon entropy. It's not like we zip the table, okay? It's not a compression of the table. It's a compression of the function that the table represents. And that makes it a little harder than to just calculate the Shannon entropy of the table. Because what we do remember is we say that each row represents a state transition in the table. So what we want to do is we want to compress those state transitions. And so, it, again, the, the entropy of the class balance plays a role there, but it's not a, um, it's not a uh, compression of, of sort of, of uh, coding theory, it's a compression of relevance, right? So we want to get rid of anything that is irrelevant. And so it becomes actually a lossy compression and lossy compression is not really described by Shannon entropy. That's the answer here. So now, the big question is, how do we actually calculate the memory equivalent capacity of different machine learners? And to give you an intuition right there is if you had a decision tree, a binary decision tree, it would just be the depths of the perfect tree, right? In the binary decision tree, you have yes, no, yes, no, yes, no. And each yes, no, obviously each, each level is one bit of information maximally. And that means you get the memory equivalent capacity in a, in a perfect tree, it's just the depths of the tree, right? Um, and that's very interesting, right? For example, if, if you know something like the Shannon number, the Shannon number gives the complexity of the chess game. How difficult is it to actually implement a perfect chess game based on the decision tree, based on the unpruned decision tree? And the answer is 400 bits, okay? So you need a decision tree with a depth 400, and then every perfect chess game is in there. Okay, the decision for every perfect chess game is in there. And, and again, this is very old notions, even though not very used in, in the current computer science um, methodology. And now I will talk to you in the remainder of the talk about how we do this for neural networks. But I would also tell you that if you wanna do some research, I have no idea that it's totally open how to do this for other machine learners, like for random forests, for support vector machines, for KNNs, for GMMs. We know all of these models can overfit that means they all have some memory capacity. So we just have to do and, and you know, do the math work and, and find those, okay? Um, but let me tell you how we do this for, for uh, neural networks. Um, so 
first of all, what's, what's a neural network? For me, by the way, first of all, a neural network to fit into the framework of science, to fit into the scientific method is an energy threshold. The dot product, the reason why we calculate the dot product in, in a perceptron is because it's actually energy, okay? Um, if you think about it, the apple is not just attracted from, from the earth, it's also attracted from Venus and from, from you know, the Andromeda galaxy and so on. Obviously we never count this, but if you were to calculate this, even with you know, all the zeros that you have to, to and sort of gravity pull to, from the Venus or, or the moon, um, you would have to calculate the dot product, okay? So the dot product is an energy and biologically speaking, a neuron is an energy threshold because you never think about your, your left pinky toe. Um, why would you think about it? Well, you think about your left pinky toe if I step on it, right? If there's an energy uh, input on it, um, because then it, it's ouch, right? Just like Newton's apple falling on his head because a neuron really is helping you ignore information before it actually models anything, okay? We have so many neurons in let's say our skin. And of course, if I poke you with a needle, ouch, right? Then your neurons fire. But if you don't, you don't want to think about like all your neurons in your skin all the time. There would be way too much load. So by default, a neuron is there to ignore information. And if you think about, you know, the social impact of that, you'll also get to very interesting conclusions, but that's a different story. So now as we ignore information, um, the, what do we do is how do we ignore information? Well, it's a threshold, right? We say if something is above a certain energy, um, we let it fire. If it's not, then we don't let it fire. And so that's the main major, major idea of a perceptron. And um, the way we go there is the, same, is, the, is the dot product that we have some inputs and we weigh the inputs based on their, um, uh, you know, based on each dimension of the input, each column of the input, how important is that? Now, the big problem is, would be interesting to know how, how important that is. And of course, now we get to the point that we need to learn those weights, okay? Now, here's another observation that is important. Um, how many bits of information is fire not fire, right? And of course, you can probably answer that right away. If you don't know the, the distribution of fire not fire, then the maximum amount of bits could be one, okay? There's not more than one bit of output. And now people go and say, wait, wait a minute, but if it's a real, what, what about this? In this lecture, we will only concentrate on binary classification. And you will find out if you play around with the TF meter app that nothing changes if you use a ReLU or something as long as your bottleneck in the end is binary classification. If you were doing regression or something, then obviously a ReLU could change something. A ReLU also does change something in the process of learning, but also we will here assume perfect learning. We will assume we'll absolutely find the absolute you know, global minimum, which we never do. Okay, what it means to not find the global minimum in training, to find some local minimum means that actually our memory equivalent capacity is unfortunately smaller than what we calculate. So what we see here is the maximum memory equivalent capacity. The same thing is the maximum amount of information is one bit because our neuron could just never fire. Uh, then there's no surprise, there's actually no information, right? So it depends on the neuron, how it's trained. If I put everything to zero there and the threshold really high, it will never fire. If I know this, well, then there's no information. But looking at an unknown neuron, how it's trained, the maximum information that I could gain is one bit. And again, these activation functions, as long as there are threshold functions, as long as they are greater than, greater equal than something, will be, will be yielding one bit of information, okay? They're also all symmetric, by the way, as you can see that there. That's actually the interesting part, you know? Not knowing what the data is, giving those symmetric functions, all we can assume are well, 50% chance for firing, not firing, 50% chance for being a below or above the curve. And that's the maximum information is one bit. That question was actually, is actually answering something that in the neural network community it was discussed for a while and not really solved. Um, it, was, it was used, there was a different formula used um, that is not wrong and that we'll also use, but we'll translate it into the framework of bits. So how, how many, uh, how many uh, uh, binary functions can a single perceptron represent? There was Minsky, uh, I think in the 50s, uh, Big Shermino was better, maybe 60s, asking this question. Um, and he asked like, and he was really angry actually. He was angry. He said, why does the single perceptron with two inputs, why is it not able to represent all 
the binary functions I would like it to do. And of course, we can give you an answer to that because we can measure the memory equivalent capacity of a perceptron in a bit. But the major point is that what they were doing is they were asking themselves, okay, linear separability, if I have some input functions, what kind of lines can I draw uh, in this space? And so here is basically what they did is they said, okay, let's say I have this, I have this function, um, these two weights are 0.9 and two, okay? And then what line does this represent? So 0.9 and two, is this line. And of course, now we have the separation, this particular one, everything below the line is not fire and everything above the line is fire. And now the question is, and again, we defined intellectual capacity as the number of target functions that can be memorized. Can we memorize all Boolean functions with one perceptron of two inputs? So all Boolean functions of two inputs, can they be memorized with all Boolean functions of, uh, sorry, with all Boolean functions of two inputs can they be memorized with uh, a perceptron of two inputs and one threshold. And we know from Minsky, and that was basically his big outrage, that we cannot. Of the 16 Boolean functions that you have out of two Boolean variables, so our two Boolean variables are x1 and x2, and now you can map those to 16 different Boolean functions. You can model with a perceptron, you can memorize with a perceptron uh, 14 of them. The two you cannot memorize are XOR and equality, not XOR, okay? Um, and interestingly enough, if you point out where the heck is XOR, XOR uh, is this one here, F6, right? And then uh, not XOR is the inverse of that, or equality is F9, right? Equality means zero equals zero, or one equals one, otherwise it's zero, right? It's also interesting because the first thing we see right here is that if you know nothing about the function is that these uh, two columns here are obviously balanced. So right there you see um, it's, a balanced, it's, it's a balanced problem. And so not knowing anything about the function, um, it would be a 50% chance um, to know whether it's zero or one. And so it could be up to four bits of information. Now we know no more about it. And so this is why this is a little harder to apply here, um, but we'll go, go for it in a sec. So there was another one, and this is, a, this is actually what I'd like you to, to read if, if you have the time. Um, so it's a book from David McKay, Information Theory, Inference and Learning. And he said, well, here's the thing. To understand Minsky's problem, the best way to go about this is to put the perceptron as an encoder into a Shannon communication channel. And he changes the, the original sh channel a little bit by doing this. He says, okay, our encoder is our learning method. He actually calls it learning method. He doesn't even um, say neuron or perceptron. He's just saying, by the way, our encoder is our algorithm, right? And our learning method here is the totality of the perceptron itself and an assumed perfect perceptron learning. Oh, by the way, we have perfect perceptron learning perceptron learning and as opposed to backpropagation actually is, no, we know it converges. It converges in exponential time. This is a little bit of a problem, but it does converge. We know exactly uh, how to implement it so that it will converge. So perceptron learning is actually absolutely getting to a global minimum. So the point here is that if you had perceptron learning, this would be a learning method, could you use this to encode all the tables, you know, all the 16 tables of, of Boolean functions? And so basically what he does is he changes the channel in such a way that he say, okay, really what we have is we have labels that go in and into an encoder and then the data is external, okay? So your data is actually sort of is your inputs. Your inputs are external and they're labeled. And now what we do is we, we convert the label into weights or parameters of you know, the perceptron. And then we send it over a channel that doesn't matter. But at the end, at the receiver end, we have those weights and we also have the original data again, okay? Again, we're asking ourselves, can we memorize? So we take the original training data in again and we have the weights. And the, the, the question is, can we now decode everything perfectly that was labeled? And of course, the answer for, for the Boolean functions is no, we know that X or not X or doesn't work. And the big question is why, right? Um, I will go, uh, did I skip this slide? Okay, uh, I, I didn't, and it's, there's a slide there that, that actually explains it, but I, I skip it because it's complicated. It turns out 
there is a function that has been found in 1852, way before we talked about neurons, um, by a guy called Schleffli. And in, um, in, uh, in the book from David McKay, it, it basically derives the formula. And I want you to actually take a look at that and, 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 see, and see it. Um, and what happens there is you find out um, that the num it basically gives you the number of unique target functions that you can implement with n parameters, okay? And it has to do with the number of, 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 of lines you can draw between different points, okay? And it turns out that for two, uh, uh, two inputs and three uh, uh, variables in your perceptron, the answer will be 14. So it means you can do 14 functions, but not 16. And in order to get there, to get to basically to get a guarantee um, that you can implement all the functions, you need to have uh, four parameters. Why? Because the number of parameters needs to equal the number of rows, but that's for perceptrons, right? And McKay just draws this curve and says, this is what we have. So N would be the number of uh, uh, sort of uh, rows you have in your table for training that you want to memorize. So the number of samples and K is the number of parameters in the perceptron. And it turns out when N equals K, when you, so when you divide N divided by K, right? So that means when N equals K, when the number of parameters equals the number of um, rows that you want to memorize, you can do it perfectly. That is absolutely what you can do. Okay, that's it. So now what we would need is a perceptron with four parameters for the two inputs and this, uh, for of, the, of the 14 Boolean variables. Now, how do you do that? You cannot. There's no single perceptron with four parameters. That's a topological constraint of the perceptron, right? So that's why this didn't work, okay? But so McKay draws this graph. This graph is N equals K. When you, when you have this, you can guarantee everything can be memorized, but there's another problem. And this is when you have a lot of attributes, when, you, when your column count goes really high towards infinity, for some reason, memorization gets easier and easier and easier. And this has to do with the law of big numbers. Um, there's a bunch of depths there, um, but it's also what they call the curse of dimensionality in statistics. Ultimately, as, as, you, as your n goes to infinity, you can actually memorize almost twice uh, the amount of information. And that's still memorization, we're still overfitting, okay? That's why we have to be careful with GMM. So now the interesting part is McKay calls this, when the n equals k case, he calls this the VC dimension, but it would be the VC dimension for points in random position. Because the problem with VC dimension is it assumes the, point, the points, the particular set of data that you're modeling can be constrained. And of course, for information, we cannot do that. We want to know the maximum. So this is the maximum VC dimension of a perceptron would be n equals k. And then this year, n, n, n 2k, so where you basically go and say, actually, with a 50% chance, we can still model, um, we can still model 50% of the target functions if we have only half the amount of parameters in my perceptron, then we have number of rows on the table. That is the actual information capacity. Um, because if you get to the supremum, you'll see that's actually how it works. But the point is that I call this the, the cover McKay information capacity because actually cover, Thomas cover did this first and McKay just gave it a much better explanation that I understood because I, I'm still working on the Thomas cover paper to be frank, but please uh, don't be restricted by me. Go ahead and, and take a look at that too. It's from the sixties. Um, now the bigger problem is this, this is all the perceptron by itself. Um, and, and, and what I wanted to do is I wanted to come up with a theory that describes the entire thing, the entire neural network. And we have to be careful because most people think about neural networks just like the networks you see here, right? This is just multi-layer perceptron. Um, I know this word is not used anymore, but that's a special type of neural network that we now call deep learning. And of course you could have something completely different, right? So for example, to actually solve XOR, um, you need to use more than one perceptron. And so what you do here is you create a topology, for example, a multi-layer perceptron would be one hidden layer with two neurons and then an output layer. This particular neural network that you see here with those weights will solve XOR. However, you could do something completely different and we call this ResNet these days, but <laughs> really it's been, it's been invented way before ResNet, it's called a shortcut network. 
where you can actually, what you do here is, I like this, I call this informed decision, okay? <laughs> so informed decision is to go with your friend to make a buying decision. Like you buy a new car, you go with a friend. You could either go to the car place to look about the cars and then call up your friend and say, look, I have this choice. The better way to do it is take your friend to the parking lot because he can actually share the original observations, right? And then he creates an informed opinion. And that's what a shortcut network does. The first, the first neuron here has access to the original information and makes a decision. That's your friend. The second neuron also has access to the original information, but also gets the decision input from the first neuron. It just basically makes an informed decision based on only based on the origin, based on a decision of another neuron and the original input. And the interesting part here is you will see in a bit that this is a very efficient way of modeling because for the amount of parameters, um, you get a lot more memory equivalent capacity because you're not constrained by data processing inequality, but that's something we'll talk in a bit. In the end, what you see is this is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine parameters to solve XOR. And this is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven parameters to solve XOR, okay? In fact, what you see on the right is as far as I know, the smallest network you can build to solve XOR, okay? To memorize XOR uh, with seven parameters. You cannot get to the optimal four because of topological constraints. Um, um, but again, uh, I don't think this has been proven. So maybe somebody can come up with something smarter. Um, but training this is a lot harder. If you see, this is nicely homogeneous. This is all once as once and minus one as parameters and 0.5 as weights. Here we have something like minus two. So we, we and 1.5 and 0 0.5 also, but basically the parameters are a lot uh, wider space to learn. And so that's why rest training a ResNet is a lot harder. So, the interesting thing is, and actually I just explained that, um, so we can just completely skip to, to this. So if you, if you now take McKay's stuff um, and, um, and basically take the log, okay? You will say, okay, 14 functions, the log two of that is three point something. And that's actually what we do. All we do here is we take the number of functions that you can model and take the log two of that because the log two is 14 and we know three point something is smaller than four. And that actually gives you the explanation of why XOR and NXOR can be modeled because if we say for all tables, right? We have four rows. So all the 16 functions, log two of that is four. So the, all the 16 functions of two Boolean variables need four outcome. So the rows, we have four rows in the tables that we represent and there's four outcomes. So that means our memory equivalent capacity for the perceptron would have to be four bits. It's unfortunately only three point something and that means we're missing some of the functions, okay? Um, right, um, Big Shah is a good, good point but I'll, I'll skip over that and we'll talk about it later. Um, so the point here is that log two of 14 is three point something and not four. And we have four rows. And I said before, we can guarantee when n equals k. So that's the point. So what McKay did, however, he showed us using this graph that the memory equivalent capacity is absolutely, we can guarantee that when the number of parameters in a perceptron equals the number of, of rows in our table, then n equals k, then we can actually guarantee memorization because all the functions so this is, oh, on the y-axis here, sorry, I forgot. On the y-axis is the probability that all of the functions can be modeled, okay? So if the probability is one, all of the functions can be modeled, right? So, and that's the trick. So now we learn two things and we can start with uh, arguing about memorization and we can start to build a theory pretty easily actually on how to get the memory equivalent capacity of networks like this. And here is how we do it. Number one, we already discussed that the maximum output of a perceptron is one bit. It can fire or not fire and not knowing what it does, there's a 50% chance that's one bit of information once you see it fire or not, or minus one bit of uncertainty, not knowing anything. That's, we already arrived at. Number two is McKay derived that the maximum memory capacity of a perceptron is the number of parameters, including the bias in bits, right? When N equals K, we know four rows, can be memorized 
with four parameters, right? And so that is number two. The maximum memory capacity of a perceptron is the number of parameters. And we count the bias because there's easy tricks on how to convert bias into weight and so on. Now, the next one is, now that's good for a perceptron, but how do I combine perceptrons? And the way I do this is I just think of perceptrons as elements in a circuit. That's actually not even wrong. When we created artificial neural networks in the early years, they were all circuits, okay? Now, here's the thing, what I can say, the maximum memory capacity of, of perceptrons. Um, oh, okay, so this is there's some. Oh, this is an old slide. Oh, sorry. So if you take and if you take perceptrons in parallel, right? So basically, you take one perceptron and another perceptron and another perceptron. What are we doing? We're taking two memory units, okay, and putting them in parallel. So basically, the trick here is if you have two memory units, which is number one memory unit is the is the um, I apologize actually, because these two rules are old. Um, um, uh, we, we solved this better. So basically you just listen to me. Basically the point is this, you have a gigabit of memory and you have another gigabit of memory. How much memory do you have? Two gigabits of memory, okay? So basically if you take two perceptrons in parallel and they independently look at the same observations, they can memorize independently. They can, they can basically just, you, you add them in a layer. So the memory equivalent capacity of a layer of neurons in parallel is, ending up being exactly just additive, okay? This is basically like capacitors in parallel, they add each, each other, okay? So now becomes the more interesting part. What happens if you have a layer and there's another layer? And that's important. This was also not shown by me, but by Tishby. We know that each perceptron has one bit of output maximally. Well, here's the thing. If, you, if I give you a gigabyte of memory and I give you five bit to memorize, what do you count? What, how much information do you have? A gigabyte or five bit? Well, you have five bit because the rest of the gigabyte is unused. And that's the interesting part. The, 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 the layer, a layer dependent on a previous layer is completely restricted by the output it sees, right? So if you have 10 neurons, you have maximally 10 bits of output based on the rule number one. And that means it doesn't matter what capacity you have in that second layer, it will be 10 bits, okay? The number of states you'll see if you ever look at this in the TF meter app is two to the power of 10, that's a lot. So maybe, maybe don't do it with 10, do it with two, okay? But you'll see there's no more than those. To fire, not fire, there will be uh, two to the power of, of that. And so that, that is actually given by the data processing inequality. And there's a whole book on that by Tishby. So we don't even have to go on that, but it makes total sense. It's the same thing as if, again, I give you five bits of information to store into a humongous storage. It doesn't mean you have more information. It just means you have more storage. <laughs> now we can apply those rules, okay? So first of all, the perceptron is three bits. Why? Because we have one weight, another weight, and, um, and, this, uh, and this bias, so it's one, plus two, uh, one plus one plus one is three. Okay, it's as simple as that. And again, um, that's the guaranteed memory equivalent capacity. And now somebody should say, wait a minute, didn't you say log two of 14 is three point something? Right. We will just simplify this a little bit at this point. The point is that it would be better to take the log two and do it, do it precisely, okay? But for here, for the engineering, for the engineering part, we can totally just go ahead and count it this way, okay? And you'll see actually that the whole thing is about maximum and it could matter once you have a lot of neurons, but it really doesn't um, because the way we build networks, it's constrained in various ways. So at this point, we just say three, okay? Now, what we do is we add it. We, if we have a, net, a neural network like this, we add them. We say three plus three is six. And then we have, oops, I forgot to have a bias here. So we have one plus one plus one again would also be three or you know, your three point something, but we already know that it's constrained because this is only one bit of output and this is only one bit of output. So while this capacity itself of this output neuron is three bits, we don't have three bits of information. We have only two bits of information, which is the information from this neuron firing and the information from this neuron firing. So in the end, the total memory equivalent capacity ends up being three plus three plus two or eight. 
right? And do you already see why I'm skipping the digits after the point? Because really they only matter for the first layer. <laughs> so if you want to be more precise, it would be three point something plus three point something then then two. And so, yes, you can do that. But also if you do this practically, it's just a, it's just a hassle, just, just do that. And it also has to do with the fact that we want to memorize anyway. And since, since we're memorizing anyway, um, you will see that we want to actually generalize later. So we'll have to reduce that anyway. So just keep it there. Um, it's easier to do the math, but I want to be precise. I want to tell you that there's a little reduction in here. So now we do this, the deep, a deep layer network has two, two, two things. Well, let's do the same math again. One plus one plus one is three. So th three each perceptron and that gives us six bits. Now the interesting part is for a secondary layer, how many bits of output do we actually have here? Well, while we have two arrows coming out of this perceptron, is that two bits of output? No, it's the same bit, <laughs> right? The same firing, it's firing there and there, same firing there and there. So the total number of bits coming out of those two perceptrons is two, full stop, okay? Just because you draw a lot of arrows doesn't give you a lot more information. And so you get two bits out, that means three plus three, and now two is, is basically, um, uh, the second layer, while it has six bits independently, it only looks at two bits of output. So it's six plus two, and then we have the same thing again, plus two is 10, okay? And you see, obviously right now you see, it doesn't make a lot of sense to add a lot of neurons in a later layer. And if you try that out with the TF meter app, you will see that's exactly how this behaves. And uh, what you should be doing is something triangular, right? And the funny thing is, if you talk to image people, they already figured that out empirically and they say, oh yeah, it's just like image pyramids. Yeah, of course it is. Because information is dependent and it, it just explains it. But this theory also explains a ResNet or a shortcut network because here's what happens. Why is this more powerful? Well, it's more powerful because I would do three again for the first, but the second one actually has one, two, three, four parameters and I don't have a data processing inequality constraint because assuming I have a lot of bits in the input, I can totally go and say, well, this is one, this is two, this gets the independent input, right? And then obviously I also get the output from the other one. So I have to count this as fully. There's no data processing inequality here because there's, no, there's not just the dependency, there's also a look into the input. We are, the information is only constrained by the input. Of course, if you gave that a table of four rows, then you don't have seven bits, right? You could memorize seven bits, but if, if the information is there, yeah. But we assume that obviously there's a lot of information coming in. And so, yeah, this right there explains the efficiency of ResNet and, and shortcut networks. Um, um, yeah, so this, well, we know that this, yeah, exactly. So this, this, uh, this, uh, last network can prov provably memorize a 10 row input table, whatever the table is, as long as it's balanced binary. Actually, as long as it's binary, unbalanced is easier. So as long as it's binary, it can, it can absolutely guarantee to memorize uh, 10 inputs. And this one here can absolutely guarantee to memorize uh, a row of seven, uh, sorry, a table of seven rows uh, binary classification. That's what this means. And now, we were asking ourselves, what about, what happens if we, to the McKay curve, right? So what happens to that, to that information limit too? And it turns out data processing inequality, the optimal network in, in theory is already the perceptron. What we do is that the neural network itself just behaves exactly the same way as the perceptron would in total. It's just the topological surrounding around it and you get to two. And so the theoretical curve looks like this, but if you do it empirically, you'll find out you can actually measure the quality of your learning algorithm and the quality of your implementation of your neural network. Because in the end, your neural network should have that McKay curve just like the single perceptron did, but it doesn't. So the McKay curve is characterized by the fact that when N divided by K is one, you should have the probability of a perfect, of all the functions being able to be classified A equals one. And, the, and when N divided by K equals two, the probability equals 50%. That's your perfect curve. But it turns out um, 
and it, it kind of depends on the number of, of hidden layers, okay? So it turns out if your number of hidden layers is, if Kolmogorov said, you can model everything. So if, you, if your number of neurons in your hidden layer is infinite, then you actually get the perfect McKay curve. And if you get less uh, than that, then it's, it's not as perfect, but still it's characterized by the fact that it, n divided by k is one, it's one, and n divided by k is two, it equals 50%. Uh, now, if you do this empirically, it's actually difficult because you have to go through all functions. <laughs> and that's a lot of functions. So what we did is we sample all the functions and that's why you get these little wiggles here, okay? Because we, can, we couldn't get to all functions, but we tried that. And we basically tried to take as scikit-learn as three-layer multi-layer perceptron to see if you do this practically, how well would it resemble this model that we, we create there? And it turns out scikit-learn is actually pretty freaking good. You get to the point where you have n divided by k equals one. Um, mostly works unless it's the you know unless it's just two neurons or something. And also for the single perceptron, it totally works. The single perceptron is here, okay. And then if you have if you have like eight hidden neurons, or it gets better and better and better. And that means that we get closer to the point where n equals k actually means you can memorize everything, and n divided by k means you can memorize half of the functions you put in. And again, this is, um, this is, is sort of a probabilities based on sampling the network. Now I can tell you there are neural network frameworks from Google <laughs> that are not nearly as good. I've seen neural network frameworks where the cave cave curse in here, okay? That means you need a lot more neurons than you would ever need. And the reason for that is some bogus regularization techniques that never get you there, okay? They will basically try to regularize the heck out of it so that you get good generalization results, okay? Because what this regularization does, it will give you a memory equivalent capacity that is much lower. And that means, yeah, because of that, you're not memorizing. But for me, that's not the right way of doing it. I want to first understand what our memorization bound is and then we reduce parameters from there and not have some bogus regularization technique. And why do I call it bogus? Why, do I, why am I so judgmental? Because obviously your regularization technique will introduce a bias that you don't know. I want to work bias free, okay? I want to say I memorize, that's what I need for memorization. And then I reduce my parameters or then I do something that of my choosing or of general nature to, to, to get to generalization and not by just basically having Google decide for me what bias I need to accept. That's where my judgment, the judgment comes from. So the trick here is now we need another trick to this, for this to be actually be practical. Um, and that trick is how do I actually get to a rough prediction of requirements of, um, of memory equivalent capacity for neural networks that is maybe a little bit better than just counting the number of rows, okay? Um, and I will introduce you one um, and it worked so much better than I ever thought. And I, we, it's basically became a commercial product once we make this really good. Um, and it's, it's, um, it's almost a miracle and it's a very, very simple technique. Um, so, um, I tell it almost a miracle because I still don't understand why it works so well. Um, so the idea is the following. Again, we could say the number of rows, but could we be better than that, right? Um, so given data and labels, how much actual capacity do I need to memorize the function? Okay, so what is my limit to do that? Um, and of course the worst case is um, we just build a memorization network and train everything and say, ha, ah, that's what I need. And then we train again and train again and train again. So we want to measure this before we train. And that's important. It's a funny thing about entropy, right? We do information theory here. So <laughs> entropy can be measured without encoding. We, we, we can just calculate it. And without creating an encoder, we can say, well, the best encoder would do this. That's cool because creating an encoder is a lot of work. And if you ask anybody in, in information theory, they worked on this for a long time. And that's the trick. If we can measure this typical size of a neural network before we build it, then we obviously have very rigorous experimental design. And that's how I do it. Um, what I do is I assume all weights to be one, okay? The big work in training neural networks is to, to basically 
create the weights, right? Um, now what, I've, what I can do though, is I can say, no, let's only learn the thresholds and keep the weights at one. Now that's a very learning restricted neural network, right? That's a neural network where I only have the biases trained, but um, the, the, the weights are basically, we, we have a dump network. I call this a dump network. But the trick is it's basically becoming a lookup table, right? Because our dot product right now is not anymore the sum of W i X i, it's just the sum of X i. That means all I need to do is add the, the, the samples and the columns. And then I ask myself, okay, do they belong to the same class or not? And I draw these thresholds, right? Now you will have hash collisions. This is a hash table, right? You will have hash collisions. Fine, we will just assume when we have a hash collision, we add another neuron, it will be resolved by the learning algorithm later. So what comes out of this is the number of neurons that um, we, we, we need maximally to memorize the table if we didn't even train the weights. We only trained the biases and this can be done in n log n time because really kind of only needs sorting of values. The, the, the algorithm is here and um, uh, it's also, there's an open source. If you go to TF meter, there's a repository where you can try this out. Now, what is the problem with this algorithm? Well, the good news is it's highly efficient. It's n log n time, it's really fast, even for big things. There's hash collisions. The bigger problem is, it's really dumb, right? I mean, most of the stuff in the network is weights. So if we set the weights to one, what is the, what could we expect to happen in terms of improvement? And the interesting part is that on, on this set of slides, I was still making it a assumption and we can now actually show this. So the trick is that the assumption was if, if I have maximally exponential training, which is what I'm, what I'm uh, sort of approximating using backpropagation, which is nothing else but a Monte Carlo method. If I have exponential uh, training time, then obviously I should have a logarithmic reduction in this, in this dummy network. And it turns out that's absolutely true. And you can actually show this much easier. And, and here's a, a quick version of this. Um, let's assume you have a balanced binary table and you take a neuron that you don't train. Okay, so you take a random perceptron and you, want, and you want to see how accurate is that random perceptron with random weights on a random table with balanced binary classes. Well, it's gonna be 50% accurate because a best guess, this, is, this neuron is nothing doing else but an expected best guess. And what it does is that means that neuron will give you 50% accuracy despite the fact that you didn't train it and the table is completely random. random. That's awesome. Let's take the data that it didn't correct classify correctly and add a second neuron, also completely random. Now, what's the expectation for that neuron? Well, it's also 50%. And that means those two neurons together, if I trained an output neuron, would be 75% accuracy already, despite the fact that I didn't even train them. Now, if I take another one and another one and another one, you can see how the, the hidden layer is logarithmic in size. And that means for uniform random, it's just nothing else but lock of the number of instances. Now that means is for the counting of the thresholds, it can only be better than that, <laughs> okay? So what we'll assume is that the number of thresholds after we train something, we will be lock of that. And guess what? It works pretty freaking well. Um, so <laughs> here's how well it works. Um, I tried this in, in the beginning with and X, or this is my initial experiment from an original paper. You should know we have a commercial product now and we do this all the time. And there's companies that rely on this prediction and it works, okay? So the major point is, you know, if, if you do, do this for and, you turn up with two bits, which is right. If you do it for X or, uh, which is four bits, you, you, the, the maximum would be eight, but the expected was four, which is right. And we know it's seven. So the biggest, when, when you have just a little bit of data, just like the XOR, then you have topological constraints. So it could be a little bit off. But the moment you go to more data, and this is now a hundred samples, these are, this is artificial data that you see in the TF meter app. Um, you will get these, uh, you will get these limits and these limits can be totally validated. Okay. And then ImageNet, I used images and I wanted to see, okay, uh, given, given that memorization requirement here, how well, um, 
how well uh, would it actually do? And it turns out, yes, I was able to get 98% accuracy on the training set, memorizing it with pretty much that amount of bits. And again, this is all slides. The moment we get to, we tried this, you know, more systematically, it was, it was pretty clear it worked. But uh, the original experiment here that is in the original publication is, uh, and then Taylor is in this GitHub and you can totally use uh, uh, and, and test my algorithm that I gave here that which is implemented in that GitHub to see how much, how well it works for you. Okay, if you don't take my word for it, please try it out. Okay. Now I have to, close this whole thing with one important thing. Everything we discussed right now for the last like, long, long, uh, you know, a number of minutes was memorization. And of course I said in the beginning, we don't want memorization. Memorization is 6514, it doesn't give us anything. We want to perform well on a validation set. So how do we do this for, how do we actually go away from memorization? Um, so there's a bunch of problems, right? Um, and one of the problems is that we use backpropagation. <laughs> backpropagation is just significantly flawed. And it has to do with the fact that it's a Monte Carlo method. It's guess and check, guess and check, guess and check. Um, I have no answer to how do we train things more systematically. I actually do have an answer. I, mean, I can't talk about it. But I can tell you that a big mistake that we're making in current research is we're designing these big networks and then we use a Monte Carlo method. Every engineer in the world would not start with a bunch of parts and then try to fit them together. Every engineer in the world will say, okay, I have some data. I can measure how big the network should be. Why don't we go perceptron by perceptron and build it up from scratch? And of course, that is what we do in, in Brainome. And basically take a look at this brainome.ai. We have, we have this demo because guess what? I just told you that perceptron learning by itself is actually solved. <laughs> So if you train each one layer independently, um, you can actually get to a lot more, um, to a lot uh, a better approximation. But there's a problem. Um, again, perceptron learning will also take exponential time. So even we have to take shortcuts. Every, everybody has to take some shortcuts. But I can tell you from my experience, if you build a network up from scratch, rather than just throwing at it and hoping it works and with Monte Carlo, then you are in a lot better control of those trade-offs and of sort of the th basically saying, okay, we know it's exponential time. Um, maybe we don't go there. We just cut off the computation and add another neuron that's suboptimal, but then it solves the thing not, not optimal, but closer to optimal than if we, uh, because we just don't have the, the resources to spend exponential time. And, and sort of this is the idea um, there and again, it creates networks that are about, uh, by the way, that are about ten uh, times smaller, sometimes a hundred times smaller than what we're currently using. It does the whole thing in a systematic way. It gives you error bounds. You can do a bunch of stuff. Basically, nobody would do. Oh, here, let's build something. We build this brick by brick, right? You don't build something by just the random parts and hope they fit. I mean, you can, but it's kind of weird. I think it comes from the assumption that in, 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 in this research of it, we have this brain, right? Let's see how the brain trains. I get it. But if you wanna do engineering about it, if you want to do experimental design, you build things up one piece at a time and within the constraints of what you know, and you know, you don't wanna memorize, right? Um, so how does the curve look like when you go from memorization to generalization, when you reduce parameters to basically say, each state transition should not just represent a, you know, a row in a table, it should represent a lot of rows in a table so that we have a chance that when an unknown row comes in, it's just represented right by that same state transition. Well, again, memorization is worst case, um, uh, and, uh, worst case uh, generalization. So if you don't want to build up a network piece by piece, which I would suggest, but if you want to do it the old way, well, then what I would say is start with a network at memory equivalent capacity and then you half it, half it, half it, half it, okay? And the curve you're gonna see looks like this, okay? So this is your accuracy of your network, okay? At, at memory equivalent capacity, you should be at 100% because you can memorize your table, okay? And then as you quantize, and I will call this quantization because there's obviously different techniques. You could do regularization. You could actually get rid of parameters. You can do all kinds of stuff to reduce the memory equivalent capacity. 
And so I would call this quantization just as a general term. As you quantize, you will get rid of um, basically accuracy. And of course, if you have just one perceptron for a billion samples and they're completely random, you'll get to basically zero accuracy at some point. I mean, um, if it's a perceptron, you get to, you get to percept, I mean, again, if it's a perceptron, then it's 50% expected, but this also assumes like a multi-class problem. At some point you get to zero or, or close to zero. The point here is that's how the curve looks like. And then there's something we haven't talked about yet, which is also in this curve, it's noise. What you want to do is you want to generalize away the noise, right? In reality, what we hope is that we have a precise function, but there's a lot of noise there, right? And so the trick here is, is if I, in, instead of two, four, six, eight, ten, 10, where the rule is plus two, I gave you 2.2, 3.8, .2, uh, um, uh, uh, 6.1, uh, 7.9, and so on. So a noisy set of values, your rule stays plus two. It's just plus two plus minus noise. So what it is, is my general rule stays plus two, but it's only accurate within a boundary. And so the problem though, is if the network memorizes the, the, the like 2.2, 3.8 and so on, that doesn't help, right? So you, because then you memorize with the noise. If you can extract the rule, you get the actual rule and you get the noise away, despite the fact that your prediction will be off by the noise. And now why do I tell you this? Because there's, the curve should be basically going down steadily until you get to the point where you actually cut down in the information. So as we quantize our model, as the model gets smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller, we should get to the rule. And then this basically here is our noise, right? This, 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 this between accuracy and what we get is our noise. But once we get into, once we get into not just the noise, but also we can't model the rule completely anymore, then you get a really steep decline in accuracy. Because obviously, if I don't have enough memory to memorize plus two, I'm really messed up, right? So this point where the curve goes into like complete dip is what I call an approx because you actually have a noise measurement here. <laughs> you can actually measure your signal to noise ratio by, by basically looking at this dip. And this is why I call this an approx, which is noise approx. And I am apologize because I just realized, I don't know, I've done this for a couple of times with noise means uh, I used N before for the number of rows, okay? No, this is not the number of rows. This is the approximative noise. And the, the reason why this curve looks a little different, it doesn't fit the, um, uh, it doesn't fit so much uh, the, the presentation is, uh, I first kind of want to apologize for it, but then I don't because the reason is because I took this from a different presentation. And that was a presentation of how to measure the noise in images using JPEG compression. And guess what? You get to the same curve. And what you do here is you quantize the Q, the quantization factor in JPEG, and you, and you see the accuracy, which is basically the, the SNR of how well you could represent your, your original image. And you get to the exact same curve, the exact same noise measurement. And the next publication we wrote is, you can actually reduce your convolutional layers in deep learning by using JPEG. Because JPEG is the same as just reducing sort of noise. In fact, the same as the convolutional layers do. And to show this, we, 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 we showed these curves, okay? So now that is actually a very signal processing uh, argument, but why not, okay? So in the end, what we do is we extract the rule and if we need enough memory in our model to, to, to memorize the rule, if you cut into the rule, you get to a very bad point. If you, if you just realize that you extracted away the noise, congratulations, because that's actually what you want. And you just have to accept that your accuracy won't be 100% because your accuracy can only be, with noise, your accuracy can only be 100% uh, if you memorize. Um, that's the point of noise. Okay, so in general, um, and again, this curve went to, went to a lot more practical uh, than I, I started with my theory, but the point is in general, overcapacity is not a good thing, okay? Yes, we have the lottery hypothesis paper from MIT and so on and so forth, but I wanna be an engineer. I wanna actually make sure I build stuff that I can give guarantees on. And so I will tell you that doing machine learning the way we do it right now, just basically paying a bunch of money to Google is really good for Google. 
<laughs> but it's a waste of money, energy, and time. And if you want to be Berkeley, then it's also bad for the environment, okay? <laughs> because waste of energy is always bad for the environment. So what you want to do is you want to get the least amount of parameters. The less parameters, the better the generalization rule. Um, also, it helps explainability, right? Um, it just means each parameter adapts to more samples, right? Within the framework of how intelligence is defined. And that is means because of each parameter adapts to more samples, it means there's a higher chance that an, that an unseen sample can be predicted correctly. And um, we actually, there's another talk that I gave, uh, which is basically saying the, the number, uh, that this is obviously completely congruent with Occam's razor. Occam's razor says we want the easiest explanation because the, the more parameters you add, the more it's easier to just explain something with coincidence, right? <laughs> because a lot of parameters, it could just be coincidence, right? And that's why it's also a lottery hypothesis because winning the lottery is coincidence, <laughs> okay? So um, this is Occam's razor and I, I uh, put the slide up because it's really fun. Um, this is from Wikipedia. And they define Occam's razor as among competing hypotheses, the one with the fewest assumptions should be selected. You have to be careful among competing hypotheses that are correct, among competing hypotheses that explain the data, the one with the fewest assumptions should be selected. And assumption here is parameters. Um, now, funnily enough, they were like, yeah, that's a very short explanation of Occam's razor. Maybe let's try a longer one. And the longer one is for each except the explanation of the phenomenon and then we will blah, 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 and so on. Uh, you want to go with the first one. <laughs> it is really funny. It's a sort of a meta thing that you see Like if you look at the second explanation, it's very hard to explain and then uh, to understand. And you go also in there and it's kind of like, okay, we don't really know what they're saying there. Exactly. Go with the first one. Um, and um, you can totally, by the way, um, go to multi-class um, and, 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 and regression and have these, uh, these uh, generalization measures uh, be general um, because it's all about memorization. But ultimately, here's the other thing. There's a non-statistical definition of um, in the literature of generalization. And people are always asking me, how does that fit? Well, it does. Because remember, so what this say is that we want a cat, right? So this is your cat, right, X. And then you have some cat that's a little different, right? So there's a, some distance measure between X and X prime. And you want to say, well, if, if the cat is within a distance of, of, of the original training cat, then we should say cats and our labeling, which is F of X, should say, it should be the same lab labeling as, oops, as the, uh, sorry, I need to go, uh, should be the same labeling as the um, original cat. That's the whole point of generalization. Because a dictionary, for a dictionary, your delta would be zero. It has to be the exact same cat for the dictionary to repertize that this is a cat. But the point is that we can actually add noise. And so now people are like, but really does reduction of parameters help? Well, I don't have the slides and the time right now, but the way to prove that reduction of parameters helps is obviously to create a generative adversarial network and reduce parameters in the original network and see that the adversarial examples that are generated will become noisier and noisier and further and further and further away from the original examples that were generated when the network was huge that were super close to the training examples, right? So the reason why the koala uh, or the bear wasn't the koala bear anymore in the first adversarial example paper when we added a little bit of noise is that they had too many parameters in their network. If they had reduced or they didn't train enough, okay? Both of these are true. If you had reduced parameters and trained enough, then it would be a lot more noise that would have to be added for this to be an adversarial example. And if you do this with, for example, MNIST, you will see that if you, if you reduce your network to like 10 neurons, it can be really, really, really smart, small. And then this distance gets larger and larger and larger, which is great. And then what happens is again, each state transition takes on more and more parameters. This is why this distance grows. And what then happens is that obviously you get to the point where your adversarial examples have to be completely off. And that's okay. Because if I give you a completely off number, you don't know what number it is. And that's okay. It's not an adversarial example anymore. Then you're actually, um, then you're actually doing the right thing. 
Now, what is an adversarial example? An adversarial example is a contradiction to the generalization assumption, okay? So we don't want these contradictions because they create issues. Um, so that's basically all I have. And I think we're also uh, chiefly out of time. <laughs> so so um, I want to uh, invite you to play with this app which where you can build a neural network and, and also um, and see the, the capacity and then you can train it and see the capacity demand here is, is this approximation algorithm that I showed. And as you add noise, it goes up and as and different things you can do training set. There's a bunch of things you can try. There's a newer version out that has a couple of bucks, but it can do resonance. And I'm really proud of that because you see a bunch of how resonance works. Um, and there's also, if, you, if you're interested in sort of how this works even more systematically and how to do uh, experiments with it. Um, we have brainome.ai, um, it's on the beginning of the slide. Uh, take a look at the demo and, and try this out. You'll see all these measurements. They're a little dumped down because obviously we don't wanna throw terms like memory equivalent capacity right there at customers who've never seen it, but it's all the same. And if you click on the help buttons, you see exactly how things work. Um, and and it, it should help you actually, you, it should help you uh, design your machine learning experiments you will find out that you need a much smaller network than you, you probably uh, thought you need. And yeah, that's where we are. Um, um, that's, that's all I have right now. So I would say thank you very much. And if you have questions, um, first of all, I can be online for a little more if that's okay. I don't know if I'm interrupting anybody there. The other thing is um, I just sent me email. Um, maybe you should put my email in the chat. Uh, stay chat. Oh, I don't have a chat. be posting your contact information on Piazza, so they should get Perfect, it. exactly. And please don't hesitate to contact me and ask me questions about this. Um, also, I'm, uh, I'm uh, completely uh, encouraging you to Google the experimental design uh, class that, that I'm giving. That basically gives you this and more in a lot more lectures because, you know, this is sort of a very condensed version, right? But again, um, I'm open for questions. Thank you. So has this already been added, added as a TensorFlow play, playground, someone asks? Yes. The short answer is yes. Yes, the answer is yes. So the TensorFlow meter is the TensorFlow playground um, uh, with all these metrics, basically. Yes. Yeah, answer is yes. <laughs> let, me, let me stop the recording now briefly, okay. Okay.